Thank you, Daniel. You did a great job as the last speaker on a, on a high-powered panel. <laughs> so you didn't have to worry about anything. Well, we have heard from very distinguished people representing different viewpoints on the problem of the day. Uh, they all had great ideas for us. I think they've given us a lot to think about. And at this stage, we have some time, about 25 minutes or so, for, for, the, for all of you to talk to our panelists and ask them our questions. I'll invite Dr. Prasanta Galita, director of the ADM Institute for the Prevention of uh, Post-Harvest post Loss to moderate this session. Thank you very much, Pradeep. Good morning, everybody, again. Um, if you all want to stand up and sit down, just, you know, I know sitting here for that long may not be very easy, and please, uh, please do so. I, uh, I would like to invite uh, some of uh, our, well, I'll, I'll open it up to the, the audience to ask a few questions, but before that, uh, Dr. Rudin, you gave a very powerful message in a very short time. I was so impressed, and I was going to write everything, but I couldn't write it, you know, because you're, I just could not take my years off and, 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 and start writing. So, you know, you are the kind of world pioneer and leader in, 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 chain, in addressing the challenges of, of uh, how we can feed the people of the whole world. So, you, your initiatives are widespread all over the world. What are some of the challenges that, that you have faced and, and how do you see those challenges can be, or can those be turned into opportunities? Okay, thank you, fantastic. Well, that, that's a uh, tough question and I won't try to answer it in, in one minute. I will say with regard to this challenge as so many others, and I intimated that in my comments, this is really, these complex problems require systemic approaches. And so often we talk about collaboration among the sectors, but this is way beyond collaboration among the sectors, and that's what we see in these increasingly complex problems. This is really starting your work by designing for yourself the entire system in which you are working. Not because your work will directly touch every piece of the system, but if you don't do that, you don't know how to get maximum leverage from what others are doing. You don't know where the antibodies may be to your own work because there are other interests pushing in different directions. And you don't know really what the power of that leverage has the capacity to do. Thank you so much for talking about my book, The Resilience Dividend, because whether it's resilience or anything else, the notion that the Rockefeller Foundation has been promoting is that we don't have to get only one outcome for every single investment. That if we're thinking in this more integrated systemic, systemic way, it's much more possible, as we Americans say, to get more bang for the buck, so that every intervention, every investment can produce multiple outcomes. But that really only occurs if you take this systemic approach. So when we're thinking about post-harvest loss, we're thinking about how to produce better economic outcomes, how to produce better social outcomes, as Erthren said, how to produce better gender-related outcomes at the same time that we're thinking about increasing food security. And finally, we're thinking about the environmental impact. Um, certain of the technologies that could be used and are currently being used um, and uh, storage and processing technologies are so important in this value chain are really bad for the environment. And so the question is, how can we continue with all of those lenses, social, economic, and environmental, as well as the more basic food security and agricultural um, productivity that so many of us work in directly, develop and integrate and therefore tip a system. So we're looking for 
tipping those systems. And that, I think, is, a, is really a signal way that Rockefeller has worked over its time and that during my time we really are trying to promote because the 21st century is so much more complicated. Thank you very much. Um, if I extend that question a little bit, trying to not make it too complicated, how do you see the role of the governments in, in some of these issues that you all are working? You can take that, Danny. Okay, thank you uh, for, for bringing that one up because I think uh, when we look at the success that has taken place in um, countries on food security and nutrition, for example, where there was uh, often, there were often decades without changing any of the indicators. And then quite quickly, countries can make a lot of progress. And this happens in, uh, uh, across the globe. It's not, uh, Bangladesh is a good example, Peru is an example, uh, where commitment to these complex issues, particularly around nutrition and food security, uh, required serious government action. And without serious government action and commitment to doing things differently, uh, the, the progress that, or let's say, the, uh, the actors that had been really active for decades, dedicated, committed, funding, and so on, didn't actually push that forward. So it, very often, on these kind of complex challenges, the role of, of a government in championing uh, the topic and pushing forward, seeing precisely, as Dr. Roden mentioned, how the pieces fit together uh, and ensuring that across ministries, across departments, uh, how that can work where there isn't a single uh, actor that can solve the problem the, let's say, the impetus to work together often, I think, really does have to come from a push from, from government, and I see that in this case, too, of course, along with all the other uh, necessary actors. Thank you very much. Anyone of you would like to address that? I'll just add very quickly to supporting everything that uh, Dan has just said and just add that there's a lot you can do, but you can't scale it up without having government support and having the right policies that will support the full value chain improvements that are required to make a sustainable difference. Thank you so much. We also heard repeatedly about the the need for involvement of the private sector. So uh, my, this question, of course, obviously you know who I'm gonna direct it to, uh, Mr. Joe Tietz. Joe, you know, uh, how can we create a more linked partnership with the private sector? You know, the question is, what is in there for them? Or should that be a question that we often ask? Rather, how can we bring private sectors for a win-win situation? So uh, thanks for the question. When, when I think of it from an ADM perspective, I really think of it in, in two distinct ways. One is more from a corporate social responsibility perspective. We have specific programs in place at ADM. ADM Cares is the program that helps sponsor uh, you know, the institute. And there really we're focused on, on some core values around education, particularly education related to children. It's around safety. We have a lot of farm safety and industrial safety programs around the world. It's around education for farmers. Um, also in the area of community engagement. You know, we operate in some places in the world where we've worked with the communities to improve fire protection or, or security or worked with the local hospitals. So that's one aspect. You know, we want to be seen as a partner in the communities, deeply embedded in the communities, and also as a good corporate citizen. There, there's a second part, though. You know, ADM, our, our business model is dependent upon agriculture, and actually it's dependent upon strong agriculture. And so we see it as, a, as, as just good business that, that we're out there trying to make, if you remember the value chain in my presentation, you know, the farmers on one side and the global consumers on the other, 
if you focus on the first part, I mentioned particularly in my business, the farmers are customer, and that's the global farmer. So actually for us to be as successful and achieve the strategic goals we want as a corporation, we, we need the, the farm, agriculture, on-farm, um, that sector to be strong. So we're always partnering, you know, it can be in innovative ways, it can be education, but it, it might be in some sort of financing or special commodity programs uh, to meet customer needs. But I think it's a win-win. When agriculture is strong, it's good for us. You know, un unlike other companies, we're, we're not farmers. You know, we depend on farmers at, as that first point of transformation of the crop. So we, we take that relationship very serious. So again, when the farmer wins, we feel like we win too. Can I? Um, I, I want to add, in addition to Joe's very good answer, on this topic in particular, we're viewing the private sector as the large purchasers. So one of the reasons that this value chain hasn't been as effective and the system hasn't worked as, as uh, efficiently is because it was hard for even socially motivated um, companies to be able to source from the smallholder farmers. So we are actually working with several of those companies, whether it's fruits and vegetables or tubers and roots or cereal and grain, to actually source more locally by helping to aggregate the smallholder farmer, figuring out the technologies that are necessary, helping the companies perhaps to bring production plants cl closer um, to their suppliers so that they get fresher um, uh, material and we see the companies, for the, these companies, it is an entire win-win. So they are able to fulfill social goals as well as doing business in a way that gets them fresh produce and creates the kinds of markets that will be absolutely necessary for us to fully reduce post-harvest loss. Thank you very much. Um, anybody? So, uh, Dr. Kazini mentioned about the, the women and empowering our women farmers. So how do you think the smallholder farmers and specifically the, the, the women farmers, what kind of uh, proactive role they should play out there? Should they always look at like they're the beneficiaries or they should be involved in the decision making upfront, how the project should be run, how the project should be evaluated? Do you have any comments on that? Well, thank you for that question. Let me just say that one of the things that my colleagues have taught me is that we always need to look at all smallholder farmers as business people, first and foremost. And whether they are a man or a woman farmer, they are nonetheless a business person. And so when we begin to talk about markets, we need to deal with them in that way. But if you go back to what uh, Dr. Roden said, when she noted that we must design programs from the very beginning that factor in the needs of all of those that we serve throughout the entire value chain, women must be a part of how we design programs. We often design programs that don't take in the cultural mores of particular communities where we serve, limiting women's ability to participate. And we then fail them. And we saw this in the early days of the P4P program where we were required to specifically design opportunities for women that in, um, involved childcare, that involved access to information where they did not necessarily need to leave their homes because they had limited opportunities to leave their homes. So it, is, it becomes an imperative that we see our work through their lens and not through our own lens in what we provide and how we provide those opportunities. Thank you very much. We also heard about I think, Dr. Rodin, you mentioned that, you know, to solve this problem, all the blocks exist, all the blocks are there. So we need leaders to assemble these pieces together. And, and it, it, it lumped into what Professor Easter mentioned, and, and you mentioned it, 
And then Dr. Gustafson mentioned it. You know, this multi-holder, multi-stakeholder approach out there. So who should be leading this effort of put, putting the pieces together? Who you think, uh, and where should we start that? I'll, I'll start it. It depends. Part of our challenge is sitting in rooms like this and deciding who leads at community level. And the responsibility that we have is providing the resources and tools to support whomever leads. And ensuring that we have the right coalitions that are organized that will support the participation of all the requisite actors to ensure the outcomes that we're working to deliver. Um, yes, I mean, certainly leadership on all of these issues is critical, but I think it's also important to recognize um, that in a problem like this, and this isn't the only one, no one is in charge, right? No one is in charge, and that's, I, I think, helpful to remember. So you have to have the right incentives, you have to have the right policies, you have to have the right kind of mechanisms in place for lots of different people and different actors to do the right thing. So I think it, it's a good, I mean, leadership critical at lots of different levels, but keep in mind, it's a problem that you cannot rely on somebody in charge to solve. I, I would add to that that it does require, as Dan said, leadership in every one of these sectors, but what we think is that it needs a systems integrator and broker and that's part of the role that we want to play in our new initiative and others will. So leadership in this kind of complex system is really about partnership. And it's how effectively the various leaders in each of the sectors can be integrated to, to provide this kind of system shift and transformation. Well, uh, I think I almost are running out of my quota of asking questions, and I would like to give our audience uh, some chances to ask questions. I would like to invite my partner in the crime, Professor Dirk Meyer uh, from Iowa State University. He volunteered to help me and you know run around the, and give uh, the microphone to some of our um, audience. If like to make a very short question, please, as we know we don't have too much time, and I know our our important. Uh, distinguished speakers, they have some other things. I know they need to, they need to be uh, going for another, another important meeting. Right here. Hello. Yeah. Hello, I'm Kumar Malikarjuna from Virginia Tech. I'm part of the uh, project and also involved in other USA 800 projects. One of the key questions that nobody has talked about, like I'm um, just kind of trying to throw in a little bit of a disturbance here, is the role of media. And I think we had a conference, similar one in Haiti, and one of the talk was about aflatoxin in groundnuts. And then the, somebody in the media, he took the message, and then the next day the newspaper said like, oh, we are all eating poison, you know, kind of like a negative message saying that don't eat peanuts. Even though like groundnuts is one of the major nutritious source providing protein to a lot of people in the world. And then that was a negative message. And all of a sudden we said like, oh, what did we do wrong here? So a similar thing that like another example is the climate change. Some of our, our believers, some of them, we say like completely deny that that doesn't exist. So what is the role of media and how we as an Augustus group can help pass the right message? Well, I, I'll take that on and I'll expand upon it because there's another issue that we didn't talk about and that's the role of big data and the data transformation and access to information. And what media provides is another outlet for information and it becomes very much a part of how we communicate with those we serve to ensure that that value chain, those partners are providing the appropriate information across the space and time that is required to make the differences that are necessary. But it also requires, it also provides an opportunity for us to share learnings and successes with other other communities from um, programs that are being implemented that I don't think that we as a community have completely embraced and used to, to its full value to date. 
Uh, uh, hi, yeah, it's Santori Chamley. I'm a journalist. Um, I would just like to um, find out how some of these important initiatives uh, can be funded. Well, we're at Rockefeller uh, about to launch in a month or so uh, over $100 million first step at that. Um, and uh, we'll work with WFP and many of the others on that. And, and, but it's not only the funding of the work, and that's why I jumped on, in after Joe. It's also enabling the private sector to be able to source and utilize more effectively. It's developing secondary local markets. Um, which again uh, requires a little bit of funding but more kind of integration. So I think there are a lot of actors committed to funding this, but we think unleashing private capital and bringing market-based solutions into this is an absolutely critical element to the sustainability of several of the initiatives that we've seen have had sort of nascent success in the past but never, as Earthrun said, we're able to get to scale. So it's really thinking about um, that private capital and private investment capital that's looking. We know that there are many ag uh, agricultural investment funds that are looking for new ideas. Um, so let's not just think about the traditional sources of funding from the donors. And we donors are thinking more creatively about using our, our um, money as financing and leverage mechanisms in addition to just direct support for outcomes because that's how we think we're ultimately going to get all of the resources that this will take. So I, I mentioned uh, in my comments that ADM uh, initially uh, supported the Institute with a $10 million grant. You know, I think that that actually is, is this year coming up for renewal. So that's going, another request is before our, our ADM CARES, the program in, in which this falls under. So that's an ongoing process as we speak. But I think there's another part of support that's equal to funding. And, and it's about when a company like ADM um, takes on this initiative, you know, we, we have a, a lot of professionals that this isn't their job. This is not my job. You know, I run a business, I run a global business, but we contribute our time and our effort to make this a success. And actually, the, the money is great, and I think it's very important, but I actually think equal to that importance is that foundations and, and partnerships and private corporations, you know, they, they, they allow their most creative and, and perhaps uh, people within their organizations, we have 34,000 employees, you know, the opportunity, those with passion on the subject to be involved and contribute their time. You know, and that's, that's soft money, but I think it's actually more important than the actual top headline number. Because if big organizations that have the financial means, you know, give their, their best people forward, you know, I think it makes uh, initiatives like this a bigger success. My name is Alexandra Spieldock, and I'm the Executive Director of Compatible Technology International. We're a global NGO. We're based in St. Paul, Minnesota, and our primary focus is on providing post-harvest uh, solutions for smallholder farmers with a particular emphasis on targeting rural women. And I very much like the comment about if you train a mama, you train the family, and, and you have the reverberation effect. And I think that a big challenge has been that we um, tend to uh, look at women farmers and farm families as beneficiaries or end users rather than incorporate them early on into, in, into the design process of technologies, really considering farmers as co-designers of the tools that will, they need that um, are, 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 are a preference to, them, to their um, needs at the family level, at the community level, et cetera, but also for their economic opportunity. And the other challenge is how can we invest in stronger uh, women-led initiatives to promote, to train, and to have some control over the economic initiatives that the 
post-harvest technologies can provide. And I think this hasn't been done sufficiently as a key area of work in the future. Would you like to add this? Uh, it, if I could just make one comment, I mean, I think we all here really are in agreement on that, but just to uh, reinforce that, it's interesting, especially since uh, we have a lot of engineers and agriculture scientists in the, uh, in the audience, including ourselves, right? But it's, an, it's interesting that it took so long for uh, lots of um, researchers and others to understand that uh, farmers were women. And it's, it sounds incredible, actually, but it's because we were looking at plants, or we were looking at soils, or we were looking at animals, or we were looking at uh, silos or something, but we weren't actually looking at kind of the system. And I think uh, once that happened, then of course, lots of other things can happen. And I think uh, I really like this idea, too, of kind of the dividend of of bringing that in. You get a lot of other things once you start looking at the system in a way that, that actually makes sense, and I think what you said fits right, right into that. Well, thank you very much. I think at this time, looking at our, our time constraint, I'll uh, stop um, inviting any more further question from our audience. However, I would like to ask the last question, maybe, if you, if you allow me. If I would like to... Uh, ask open to all our distinguished panelists here. If, you know, we have people here from 62 countries and they have come here with a lot of expectations, excitement, sharing knowledge and finding people, oh my goodness, you know, you are the one that's doing this work, oh. So if you would like to give them a message, one, to take home, one message, what would that be from this, con from this Congress? President Easter, would you like to start that? I, I think a key message that I continue to come back to is that this is a, a problem that requires everyone to be engaged and engaged collaboratively. So I, I think as we go forward from this point, this isn't the end of a conversation. Hopefully, as you go back to your home locations, you'll continue to contribute to the discussion and over time, that will bring us all to a better place. <laughs> I didn't know I was going next, but uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'll take a little bit different approach and say, you know, the, the issue that we spend a lot of time thinking about as we go to 2050 and we see the growing population, growing GDP, and how we're going to meet that demand. And, and I guess the message I would say is there's not one silver bullet, you know, there's not one solution, there's a number of solutions, you know, we need to uh, improve yields, you know, we need to, if there is, you know, I think uh, in the comments you made, you know, some land that can sustainably come into production ag, can we make the supply chain more efficient, you know, can we work on important issues like the prevention of post-harvest losses. You know, for me, it's, it's, it's about a, a cluster of, of individual acts that actually help us get there. And I think that this is an important one of that cluster of things we can do. And it's really important because I think the challenges of feeding the world by 2015 is a big task. Well, I, I think I've made the point, the overarching point that I want to make about the systemic approach and the multiple wins for every single thing you do. So let me leave you with what many of my colleagues are saying. We now have about 800 million people who go hungry. If we reduce post-harvest harvest loss, we could feed a billion six. That will transform individual lives, it will transform countries, and it will help to transform a society that will fulfill a broader global aspiration for peace and security. So what you are doing and what we are doing here together is so important in the overall context. And when things get tough in the lab or you don't get the approval for the next thing that you want to do, remember what an important function you really are serving. It matters. Thank you.
if I'll just pick up on where, where Dr. Roden left off and say, when you think about the fact that addressing the challenges of post-harvest losses that we could feed a billion six people, we could not feed them, they could feed themselves. And that is what this is really all about, yeah. is the opportunity for people to feed themselves. More nutritiously as well, because by reducing post-harvest losses, you also reduce food, you also reduce food safety challenges like aflatoxin, which means that you're providing more nutritious food. So you're providing the ability for people, for women, to feed their children more nutritiously, more sustainably. That's a goal we should all embrace. I would say, in addition to what's been said, uh, the world is paying attention to this. We have uh, an interesting time where there's momentum on this. And I think if we do it right, we can really see uh, the progress that we all hope to see. Ladies and gentlemen, please la let's give another big round of applause to our distinguished panelists. At this moment, I'd like to take your time to thank a few people. Just give me two minutes more before you leave. Thank a few people who have played a very important role in putting this conference together. And I'll request you to stand up as I take your name. Uh, Dr. Phyllis Wise, Chair of the Planning Committee, former Chancellor, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. <laughs> Mr. C.D. Glynn, Associate Director of the Rockefeller Foundation. <laughs> Mr. Devine Inge, Senior Officer, UNFAO. Ms. Charlene McCoyan, Senior Program Officer, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> Dr. Usha Barwal is there, Chief Technology Officer, Mahiko. Is Usha here? <laughs> John Bowman, USAID. <laughs> Kent Miller, John Deere. We also have a very distinguished guest with us, uh, Mr. Innocent Musabi Yama, uh, Permanent Secretary of Agriculture and Animal Resources, Government of Rwanda. Thank you all. We have got small tokens of our appreciations for the panelists. I'll request President Easter to present them. Innocent, if you could join us on the panel here. 